Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Facebook Live from the North Somerset Council Executive. I'm Don Davis. I'm the leader of the council and the council member for Pill. I'll introduce my colleagues um, in the turn, which I can see them on my screen. I've got to my right, Catherine. Good evening, I'm Catherine Gibbons. I'm the Labour Councillor for Milton Ward in Western Supermare, and I'm the Executive Member for Children's Services and Lifelong Learning. Okay, Mike Bell. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Mike Bell. I am the Lib Dem Councillor for Western Supermare Central Ward, and I'm the Deputy Leader of Council and the Executive Member for Adult Services, Public Health and Housing. Uh, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Canniford. I'm the uh, executive member for Place and Economy. I'm a Lib Dem councillor representing the hillside in Western Supermare. Okay, and finally, Mike Solomon. Good evening. Uh, my name's Mike Solomon. I'm uh, the independent uh, ward member for Locking and Hutton, and not forgetting Bleeden, and the Executive for Neighbourhoods and Community Services. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gen gentlemen and ladies, for your introductions. And before we start on questions, I think it might be useful, Mike Bell, with your health portfolio, if you could give us an update. We're about to go into the next stage of unlocking on Monday, and an update you could give us will be very useful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Don. Very happy to do that. So um, as everyone will know, uh, we're continuing on the on the steps through the government's roadmap uh, for unlocking the COVID restrictions. Um, and that's happened. We're, we're just about to come to the next step, uh, as Don mentioned, um, on Monday the 17th. And that's happened because the case rate has come down and, and there's been a combination of reasons why the case rates come down. Um, the, the excellent vaccine rollout program, but also obviously the effect of the, the lockdown and, and enhanced restrictions that were imposed um, after Christmas and in the early part uh, of this year. So in, in North Somerset, we've seen a steady decline uh, in our case rate uh, over the last few months. Um, and despite the relaxing of, of the restrictions, we haven't seen a big uptick. So at the moment, um, we've got around 16 uh, cases per 100,000. And by way of comparison, uh, if you go back to uh, the winter, we were in the three, 400 per 100,000 case rate. Uh, so we're now back down to the sorts of levels that we had towards the end of the summer of uh, 2020. So that's really, really encouraging and back below uh, the, the national average for England, which is which is really pleasing. Um, and as I mentioned, we've obviously made really good progress locally in terms of the rollout of the vaccine. North Somerset is one of the best performing areas um, in the country in terms of the vaccine rollout. Um, and our NHS colleagues have done an absolutely fantastic job um, getting the vaccines out as quickly as possible. So for the North Somerset population, um, about two thirds of adults um, have now had a first dose of the vaccine and very nearly a third um, have had two doses uh, of vaccine. So the progress is, is really, really good. Um, and we know that the national programme is now appealing for anyone over the age uh, of 38 uh, to get in contact. So if you haven't heard from your local GP, then you can uh, go onto the NHS and or gov.uk websites and book uh, a vaccine appointment uh, yourself if you are 38 or over and haven't had a vaccine so far. So that's, that's tremendously um, encouraging. Um, the important thing is for everyone to keep sticking to the guidelines. So at the moment, we are going through this phased unlocking. So keep up with the hand washing, make sure you're wearing um, face coverings where you have to, uh, particularly in enclosed um, spaces and indoors, uh, and make sure that you continue to practice the social distancing. You know, the best protection that we can get in terms of the spread of COVID is to do those basic things that we first heard about back in the spring of last year. So keeping your distance from people that you don't live with, um, uh, face coverings, fresh air, um, and, and good hygiene and, and hand washing. Um, the next step of the unlocking kicks in on Monday um, and that will see indoor um, 
facilities reopening. So uh, restaurants, cafes will start to be able to serve people um, indoors um, and there'll be a relaxation of the outdoor rules. So we've got the rule of six outdoors at the moment that will increase to a 30 person limit outside um, and the rule of six or two households will kick in um, indoors. So we'll start to be able to have friends and family indoors at home as well as outside, but still on a very limited basis. And if we want to keep on the programme and move to step four, which is the 21st of June and, and the government's hope that they can lift all of the social distancing restrictions and restrictions that will be in place, then we obviously need to just keep the, uh, the COVID case rate as low as possible over the next couple of months, keep ourselves on track, uh, and then hopefully we can have a much more normal summer um, and, uh, and finally see the, the back of the, uh, the restrictions that we faced. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I wonder, Mark, is there anything you need to say in terms of, our, of, of business and business support before we go into the questions? Yeah, we have been putting out emails to businesses that have been uh, entitled to the, who have claimed, first of all, the first set of grants. It's not the discretionary grants that you have claimed in the, in the past, but the, the ones that are fixed to your business rates. Those are being paid now. If you're one of those who haven't received that currently, uh, in the unlocking grant, please get hold of the, the, the business helpline, which is, I'm going to repeat it again, is 01934 888114. Um, they will guide you through it if you haven't had that claim yet. There is a discretionary element that will be coming out very soon for those businesses who don't qualify through the business rates grant um, qualification. So uh, please bear with us. Again, there's a huge amount of grants to be paid with a, with a, with a, with the team, um, but we are getting there and we will be there to support you. Now, the other thing I would say, please contact that business team if you need any further support in terms of just supporting your business through these tough times this summer. So if you need any advice, uh, any, any accounting advice, please get hold of us. We do have contracts in place to help you with those things. Lovely. And before we go on to questions, Catherine, is there anything, because I mean, bear in mind that the government has said, as we already know, the impact on, on young children. Um, is there anything you want to do from your portfolio of, uh, around, around children and young people in North Somerset? There's an awful lot going on, certainly nationally we're hearing about. I know locally there's a lot as well. There is a lot going on, <clears throat> yes. Um, I think we are all, I suppose, a, a little concerned about the effects on children of all ages in terms of mental health and anxiety. And we are hopeful that the government is stepping up and, and making additional funding available so that we can work with schools to make sure that there's some support there. Um, and I would certainly encourage parents you know, to get in touch with us or with their GP if they feel that their child is in any way showing signs of, of, of anxiety. Um, we've got programmes helping children over the summer holidays, um, those who would normally be in receipt of free school meals, there'll be activities and food club, food programmes being run over the summer. Um, Gosh, there is such a lot. I'm just trying to do to And where, 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 where will we get access information through the website, Catherine? Yes, indeed. Will they will be on the website. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. OK, fine. Well, I have a question here. The first question I've got is from Matt. And I think it's be for Mike Solomon. He's asking if there can be temporary traffic lights in Banwell until the bypass is completed. Um, okay. um, Yes, well, anything's possible. Um, this would have to go, obviously, to the transport team. Uh, they'd have to look at the highways team. They'd have to look at the legality, um, various other information. But um, it's so, certainly something I will take um, forward to the highways team to see if uh, it's something they would uh, put in place if it needs putting in place. OK, so, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the Banwell bypass, it's a pretty important scheme for, for, for us as a council to deliver. And I think the, um, the residents of Banwell um, would, be, would be very keen for us to get moving forward. But I have to say, um, thank you for the question, Matt, but um, we, we won't be building it quite as quickly as that, I'm afraid. There's, there's still quite a process to go through. We are pushing on as quickly as we possibly can. OK. Um, Right, I've got a question from, from Stephen, which I'm going to address to you, Mike Bell. Um, 
another of our residential care homes is closed down, which means we have now lost 10% of our adult residential care capacity with several other homes now in serious risk of closure. Does the council have a plan of how they will deal with the catastrophic consequences this is going to cause for North Somerset Council and our hospital? Uh, thank, thank you for the question, um, Stephen. And, and yes, um, you're absolutely right to talk about the, the, the concerns that everyone has got about uh, the residential and nursing home uh, sector. It's been under enormous pressure during the COVID pandemic um, with all of the um, extra costs and difficulties and challenges that have been associated with managing uh, through um, coronavirus um, and then of course that's had lots of knock-on consequences in terms of staffing, uh, in terms of the vacancy rates in, in uh, nursing and, and residential care homes um, and, and other factors. Um, so uh, with, with government support we've, we've given more than £10 million of, of extra financial assistance to um, care homes uh, to get them through the pandemic um, and we've just uh, announced a further package of support uh, for care homes which is targeted at um, really maximising the opportunities for efficiency um, getting the best value and, and uh, flexibility out of the um, beds that we've got in North Somerset and making sure that we support those homes that are in the best place to survive this through in the longer term. The other thing that we're doing is working with health colleagues across Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire to look at how we can commission um, residential and nursing home uh, spaces in the best possible way so that we maximise our ability to protect um, the homes that we've got. I think what we do have to recognise though is that in North Somerset we have got relatively high levels of bed capacity. There are a number of smaller independent homes uh, where um, the operators and owners are looking to, to close and move on and, and clearly the pandemic has had a, um, a chastening effect in terms of moving that forward. Um, and so I think there is going to be a bit of churn in the market over the next couple of years. What we're also looking to do is develop a long term plan so that we can make sure that we can meet the needs of the community in the longer run uh, around care. But the key piece that's missing from the jigsaw is, is government investment. Um, unfortunately, we keep getting these sticking plaster solutions and one off um, ring fenced funding from government to pay for social care. Uh, and it's just not good enough. And, and even this week in the Queen's speech, there was only a promise of some proposals later in the year from government, which is just not good enough. Uh, social care staff, um, people who are paying, uh, selling their homes in order to provide for their long term care have been waiting decades for an answer from government uh, about the long term sustainable funding for, for social care services. And until we get that, we're never going to be able to properly get to grips with the, with the challenges that the care sector faces. Thank you, Mike. And I, I think we also should take note the fact that sadly members of you know, who are living in residential care homes, several of them have died as a result of the COVID um, pandemic. And I think we they, they're in our thoughts and prayers because that's been such a dreadful thing. And I think the other thing was thanks, I'm sure, from not only from ourselves as the executive, but from the whole of the, of the residents of North Somerset for those people who've worked in care homes throughout the period because some of the sacrifices they've made keep themselves distant from their own families to secure that that safe care for for the residents of the homes has been has been quite amazing i think we we do owe them a debt of gratitude for the devotion they've given so thank you um the next question is from barbara and she said what is north somerset doing to protect the residents against displaced traffic from bristol's clean air zone well i think barbara the the question is we're doing quite a lot in the sense that we are, we, we are asking Bristol uh, City Council to explain the rationale behind the, 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 the clean air zone and, and the transport modelling they've done for that and we've only just received the information. And we've also been intensely lobbying both central government and our MPs around that as indeed the business community and a variety of groups across the whole of the, of, of, of the west of England. So um, the one bit of relatively good news is, 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 is only very old cars and vehicles, of which there aren't so many around nowadays, would be affected by this, but it does have an impact potentially on the traffic. The one thing that is clear, though, that traffic transiting through that through um, Bristol that's going from North Somerset on the A369 and A370 would be excluded from the, from, from the clean air zone restrictions. But we are working very hard to see if we come to a solution. But I, to be fair to Bristol City Council, indeed, I was speaking to the mayor yesterday 
they're under a lot of pressure from central government in terms of delivery around clean air. So they are not masters of their own destiny and how, how they set that out. Um, I've got a question from Debbie, which I think will be from Mike Solomon. What can be done about the plastic guards being ripped off the newly planted trees? I very much hope people aren't ripping them off the, the new plant tree because they're very important. This appears to be happening everywhere and the plastic is breaking up and end up in the environment. But for any more planting, is there any alternative way of dealing with this? Are they actually needed? Well, I think the answer to the question is yes, they are because they act as mini greenhouses, but that's your area of responsibility, Mike. So don't you want to say anything more? Yeah, um, obviously there's been a lot of planting um, over the last couple of years. I think it's the whips, um, the, uh, the small uh, trees that are being planted, that we planted around 23,000 of them. And it's fair to say that um, COVID has slowed things down a lot and uh, we have seen a fair degree of vandalism as well as the weather um, hitting these plastic tags. We're, we're looking to get the volunteers back again and that will help to resolve those. We haven't been able to use the volunteers um, obviously as much because of the COVID situation but there are around 400 rewilding volunteers out there and we're looking very shortly to have a couple of groups together and that's one of the areas they'll be able to address. Lovely and I am one of those volunteers. Catherine. Yes I, I just wanted to add something there. I also am one of those volunteers but um, I do walk quite often and check the areas of planting in my ward and, and also in a neighbouring ward in Winterstoke and recently when we did a big litter pick of the group of um, enthusiasts to say. <laughs> um, we, we found a lot of these plastic guards that people had taken off and, and thrown away and some had carefully collected them up and put them in a dog bin with a note saying this is plastic waste. Um, I would just beg people not to take them off if they do see them still there. They are there for a purpose. They're to stop the whips being nibbled and destroyed by animals. Um, I know they don't look great, but they do have a purpose. And um, also, if you are in a park and you see children sort of playing with them, or as I witnessed, actually deliberately breaking the little trees, um, do take the opportunity to say something. It, it, you know, just a few moments and to explain to them why we're doing this makes all the difference. Thank you. And next question I've got, um, I think it's probably for Mike Bell, though he's ha happily can pass it on to somebody else who's from Helen. What steps are North Somerset Council taking so that travellers don't appear on beach lawns again? Yeah, thanks, Helen. So um, we've got an unauthorised encampment uh, on the beach lawns at the moment. Uh, it's, it's the second encampment that we've had in a couple of weeks. Um, and really disappointing because actually at the moment we've got the some temporary barriers around the beach lawns uh, because we were anticipating needing it for additional um, car parking uh, during the bank holiday weekends and, and in this particular in both cases the the barriers have been moved in order for um, the encampment to gain access. So what we are looking at doing at the moment is we're exploring options uh, around some sort of preventative measures that we might be able to deploy around the beach lawns um, because it's clearly a very high profile and important location uh, in Western Supermare uh, and we don't want um, activity and public enjoyment and access of that land uh, be, to be disrupted by um, illegal and, and unauthorised um, encampments. It's a difficult site because it's obviously very, very large. Um, we do need to be able to allow access for events and activities. So it's not a simple uh, solution, but we're absolutely looking at that in terms of prevention. What we're also doing is working to see how we can take um, tougher action where we do have unauthorized encampments in some of these high profile locations so that we can try and act swiftly um, to, um, to, to uh, move people on where, where those encampments are having an effect on the economy and, and utility of the space um, for the local community. In parallel to that, we're also looking to try and identify some solutions that mean that we can have a site that we can direct um, any visitors who want to set up encampments, um, whether that's uh, travellers, gyps, a, ro a Romy, Roma or, or other groups who want 
want to visit our area um, because I think an important part of the mix is also having some alternative site provision that we can signpost people to. But the key key thing for me is that, you know, um, in some of these locations, um, we've had examples of antisocial behaviour and, and uh, criminal activity. But at the very least, it is very disruptive to the businesses and communities uh, that are there. And we don't want to see these important public spaces impacted in that way. So we're actively looking uh, to try and do the right things to prevent um, access where we can uh, and, if, and, and where encampments take place to try and find solutions to move people on as quickly as possible. In the case of the current encampment, um, we carried out our legal obligations in terms of welfare checks at the beginning of this week on Monday. Uh, we issued um, an eviction notice immediately. Unfortunately, that has not been uh, acted upon by the, the those in the encampment. Um, and we have now secured a, a court date to get um, a court order so that we can instruct um, eviction proceedings. It's really frustrating that it, we have to jump through these hoops, um, even in cases like this, where it's high profile land, it's important public amenity space, um, and the encampment is illegal and, and unauthorised. Um, and we are also expecting the government to introduce new legislation sometime this year that will hopefully help to, to speed up that process. So I think the message is we do take it seriously. It is not something that, that we encourage. Um, and absolutely the message is that we expect everybody that comes to North Somerset and that lives in North Somerset uh, to obey the law and to respect um, the property uh, of the public and of private citizens. Um, and we've all got the same rules and we should all be following them. Indeed, we had conversations with the police, didn't we, Mike, on this very topic um, earlier this week. And I do share your frustration and equally we are waiting for government to bring in legislation on that. And that's two, two questions and two topics and legislation has been promised for ages and, 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 and not been delivered upon. Um, okay, so I've got a question from uh, Jamie, which I'll give to Mike Solomon. Is I have a, a question, what are North Somerset Council doing about the state of Westerns roads? We have to make sure our cars are roadworthy. Uh, so why is it that the cars, so the roads are not car worthy? Yeah, um, it's the same old question, isn't it? I, and I'm assuming it's, uh, uh, this is all the pothole question. Um, this is about the time of year when we, um, we, we hire in a pothole machine. And this machine is, is a super whiz machine that can fill tens of thousands of holes. And we've just got it on board again, and we've extended the time we're going to hire it this year by another couple of months to take us right through the summer months to uh, the to the autumn time. And and then this will be out there filling in potholes very, very quickly. So, again, if if member, if residents will report that back, um, then the teams We'll, we'll get round to these potholes and if that's what's being alluded to um, and, and fix them. So, as I said, we, we hire in this machine that can have an, has a heck of a throughput and will start filling tens of thousands of potholes. Lovely. Um, I've got a question from Amanda, which um, She's, Amanda is saying, when will the parking bay changes come into effect, please? I'm looking for somebody to help me answer that one. I don't know what they mean by, what does she mean by parking bay changes? I'm not quite uh, I don't know if you know, Mark. Well, all I was going to say, if we cover, if we try and cover the, the issues, all of them, if we're looking at residence parking bays, if that's what um, uh, she's, she's, she's asking about, then... Um, we now have Councillor Robert Payne looking into that with some urgency to try and come up with some solutions by the end of the year. Um, it is something that many of us have promised to have sorted, especially for those residents who live within paid zones and obviously those residents who are very much affected because of the paid zones. And then it can be looked at rolling out further in wider areas where there is clearly parking issues everywhere due to the simple amount of cars that, that we as residents own. Um, in terms of parking charges, I mean, there has been some alterations in parking charges over the last 12 months. For example, you can now visit Western Seafront and park there after six o'clock. That was introduced because residents wanted it. Residents wanted to be able to park on their seafront to enjoy the sunsets, maybe not today in this, in this dreadful weather again, but generally, so that parking charge is now gone. So you can use that. 
We have introduced the three hour parking zones, so you can now park for longer if, if you're needing more time when you're in town. But, but other than that, um, I, I cannot think of any other um, uh, parking issues you might be talking about, but please just message again, just or Mike, Councillor, Mike Bell might. Yeah, I, I was just gonna come in because I've, I've just noticed that um, Amanda's um, clarified um, that she's talking about Seven Road and, and some of the parking restrictions. So we have just completed um, over the last year, a review of um, what are called the traffic regulation orders in, in Western Supermare, which is basically where the parking bays and yellow lines and double yellow lines are um, across the town. Um, and those changes, so we're just consulting on those at the moment. So inviting feedback from residents, which is why you'll see notices um, on lampposts and, and in the newspapers where, um, where those changes are being proposed. And then the plan is to, to do those over the course of the summer to get the changes in. So what we've tried to do is take away uh, restrictions where they're not needed to try and create some extra parking capacity uh, on street, but also in some locations introduce additional restrictions to encourage the turnover of vehicles or in some cases to prevent parking so that access to uh, driveways and junctions and, and pedestrian crossings is, is improved. Um, so that's, that's the idea. I think across the town centre there's some really positive changes that will help to create some extra parking capacity which is which I think will be welcomed by residents and and what we've definitely tried to do is remove unnecessary restrictions um, that just made life more difficult for people but please do take a look at the notices um, some of the information is also online as well with the maps um, give us your feedback over the next couple of weeks um, and then hopefully we can implement those changes quickly um, and and really benefit um, communities across the patch and I should say that the traffic regulation review uh, process happens right across North Somerset and it goes from town to town to town because um, it's really expensive and um, complex legal process to change traffic regulation orders so what we try to do uh, is basket them all together at once um, across a town um, and then obviously get the, the lining changes done at the same time because that's a more efficient and cost effective way of doing it. Thank you Mike. Um, I have a question from Dave who's asked uh, Three, two questions. Uh, the first one is whatever happened to plans to reinstate the two railway lines uh, to the Western Loop? Um, I think we'd very much like to do that as a council. But that's, that's rather a more national question around network rails priorities and, and their funding schemes. Um, that's something we keep battering on to, to network rail about all the time by improving it, you know, and why haven't we got electrification coming through to to Western, I had a conversation actually with the new West of England mayor yesterday about about, about electrification. You know, I said, well, very much we'd like it to come to Western. We thought it was going to. It was only changed at the end um, to, to, to stick it at, uh, to, as far as Bath. Um, and then he's also asked a question about, about, about park and rides in Western Supermare. Now, I think that we are as part of our local plan, which will take us through from to 2038 doing some work around transport more generally and the and concepts around local local plan and park and rise and the like will form part of those transport studies so i don't know mark that's your portfolio if you want to think more precise than that yeah i just wanted to i just wanted to sort of highlight the, the difficulty of park and ride not that any of us are opposed to it we all believe it's a really good idea and it's something we'd love to do but park and rides need to work uh, all year round and the problem with western supermare the park and ride where do you put it? If you put it by the motorway, residents in Western Supermare aren't going to drive out to the motorway to get a bus back into town. If you put it much nearer to the town centre, half the town won't use it. So it's how we locate it to its best advantage and how we put it in a place where, where, where people will start using it. Now, undoubtedly, and I think we've seen it in the past, that we've created temporary park and rides for events in Western, and I think that's really important. And it's something we really must uh, approach and look at when we get all our events running again in the town and if we can get success on the seafront because there's simply not enough parking. But those are the issues. It is in, it, it will be discussed as a policy in the local plan, how we deal with parking. Um, so it hasn't been ignored, it's just finding the solution. Mark, if I, um, Don, if I can just come in as well um, on park and rides. Park and rides work very, very well in cities where you're going in to the city to park up and to go in and shop as a couple and and and, and perhaps go in uh, uh, to a particular venue. When you turn up at seaside resorts with a large family in tow, 
with lots of things that you're carrying and push chairs, etc. It's it, it's very difficult to use a park and ride in those sort of environments and situations. So they're not the answer to everything at a seaside town, I don't think, a park and ride. Okay. But of course, with all the change we're making to the town centre in Western, we'll have so many people rushing down to use the shops. We will need a park and ride soon enough. Let's be very positive about our, our major town. The second largest town in the west of England, of course, ah, ahead of Bath. Right, I've got a question for, I think this will be for Mike Solomon from Neil, is what plans do we have for electric car charging infrastructure? Um, we, we're just going through a process now, and, and, and there is a, a, a steering group on that. Um, so we are, we're very much looking into that process at this moment in time. So it's on our radar. Uh, we'll be identifying where they can be placed and uh, how many we need. It, it's definitely something that for the future we, um, uh, we have to bear in mind because with more cars that need charging points, uh, we, it makes it more difficult, especially if we're pushing very hard as we are as a council on climate emergency to encourage more Electric, you know, if people can't ride their bikes in and they can't walk in and they can't come in on the train and they have to come in by car, then we would rather they had an electric car and plugged it in somewhere. So it's something at the moment that is definitely being looked in into as 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 a uh, a policy. And I, and I Catherine. Can I just take this opportunity to sort of highlight another problem around the electric uh, charging points is that um, and we had this with one of our residents in our ward who was offered an electric car by his work, um, but was unable to fit a charging point or even get it close enough to the house to charge it because he couldn't drop the curb on the stretch of pavement where he lived. So it is a problem in older towns to, to facilitate this. I know that you know, you're looking at it, but I think uh, people will have to be patient with us while we work out all these glitches and problems to accommodate new technology. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Liz, which I'm going to Mark Canniford. Why is it so difficult to set up a market on the Italian gardens? We've hit brick wall after brick wall and that the traders need to have a trader's license over 60 pounds for a day. Right, thanks for that, Liz. That's a really good question. And, and first of all, before I give you any form of answer, I, it would be good if we could make contact outside this forum to, to discuss that further, because that is exactly what we want on the Italian gardens. Um, I think we've, you know, COVID has made things very difficult. We approved a placemaking policy back in uh, early 2020, which in that, and in the consultation, it was very clear that the public wanted markets, um, but obviously we've not been able to do anything about that since. We've really not had the opportunity to progress with that. But very pleased if you could email me on my North Somerset site, uh, uh, email address, and we can we can discuss that further because it's something that we want and clearly you want and we know the residents want. Okay, and I've got um, a question from Alex, um, and I'll throw this open to whoever thinks they're best able to answer it. Um, a petition to government with, with nearly 11,000 signatures currently running asking the developers who have not yet rectified their buildings with dangerous cladding be prevented from starting new developments. What is North Somerset Council's view on this suggestion? Mike Bell? Yeah, so um, we're, we're very concerned about the plight of, of um, uh, homeowners and, and leaseholders who have been affected by the the, the cladding scandal. There are a number of properties, particularly in Porter's Head, that are affected uh, by this. Um, and we have been, been working hard to lobby government to do more. Um, we've, we actually had a motion and a debate on the cladding scandal at full council um, recently brought by my, my colleague um, uh, Patrick Keating and, and supported by Hugh James, a Porter's Head councillor, which was we, you know, firmly calling for more action from government. And what we're looking at at the moment is what we can do 
to help um, those affected to get access to the funding and grant schemes that are out there. We're trying to put pressure on developers to rectify the properties that are um, failing. Uh, and we have written to government to, to make the case for them to do more. Um, we're also going to look at what we can do as part of planning conditions and planning policy uh, to, to make sure that these kinds of things are prevented through planning policy as well as um, government intervention. So absolutely very supportive um, and we're trying to do everything we can to push the government to do more uh, and to step up. You know, this is a fundamental failure of government to, to make the rules uh, satisfactory. Um, they've let people down who've been affected. Lives have been lost uh, unnecessarily. Uh, and now those people are facing huge bills and huge costs and huge uncertainty um, a, as a result of, of continuing government in action. So, you know, absolutely uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with, with them. Okay. And I, I had a conversation with the fire minister a couple of months ago. So it's definitely on their agenda. He made it very clear to me that he had lots of other questions about cladding. Um, but again, we need some central direction from this. I mean, and North Somerset Council will do all we possibly can. But it's, as Mike has said, this is a, you know, a, a, a national scandal, which does need a national response. But thanks for your question, Alex. And, and I hope that uh, you're not too badly affected by this, this dreadful, dreadful, dreadful tragedy. And in fact, we had a fire last weekend in Poplar in London. Again, another building with similar cladding to the Grenfell Tower. So the problem is ever there. Um, Eddie is asking, the 2.6 million Junction 19 improvement works have done nothing to help the A369 traffic from Port said to Bristol or leaving Port Redox. If anything, it's made it worse. Once traffic is back to full rush air capacity, this will be a problem. Um, well, I I'll quickly take that one. I have been in touch with Highways England Direct, it's a Highways England scheme, and they are currently conducting their safety audit on the, on the scheme. And um, I did speak to them by email today. That isn't yet completed, but the, the outcomes of that will be fit, fed through over the next few weeks. So they are looking at it. Every scheme they do has to pass the audit. Um, I will be fair to them though, in terms of numbers, until we get back to the previous amount of traffic going to backwards and forwards to work, I don't think we'll really know if it's had an impact on, 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 the, on the traffic on the motorway. Before they did the scheme, um, pre-COVID it was incredibly dangerous when you when you were stuck on the inside lane of a motorway traffic going past 80 90 miles an hour so something need, did need to be done we were told this was the way they're going to take it forward but I think need, need to be fair to them to say when the traffic gets heavier is it actually working okay sorry um, I've got a question from um, Jonathan um, why doesn't North Somerset Council look at other ways of doing tree plant that doesn't require the plastic tree guards? Um, and just before I ask Mike Solomon that question, I got to flip to another screen, I'm sorry. Um, is Mar Mary has said there is a bio-earth, biodegradable, plastic-free tree shelter guard, um, which will eventually di safely disintegrate into the ground. So Mary has said such things exist. Um, I don't know if you want to take that one, Mike. Yeah, I'll take it, but I won't take it from a very informed point of view. Um, but I would imagine um, there's a cost impact somewhere. And, and what I'd like to do with that is to investigate it with uh, our, our um, tree officer and see if there is that opportunity to use something differently. So uh, I will take that away and look into it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Joe. How how do we go about ensuring safe off-road horse riding routes and access to bridle paths during the building of the Banwell Bypass and once it's built, please? Would that be you, Mike Solomon? It would be me. And we're doing a lot of work at the moment. There have been a lot of uh, ongoing meetings about making uh, some of these, uh, a lot of these roads safer for, for cyclists, for, for walkers, for uh, horse riders. So um, it's something the council is taking on board and taking very seriously. And you will see a lot of progress going forward along these, these safer roads where there's, there's signage, there's possibility um, of bringing speed limits down if necessary, um, reducing some of the heavy vehicles using it. I mean, there, there are all sorts of ways we can look at making these roads safer. And it's all about awareness as well, making our drivers aware 
when they're on these roads that they've got to be careful when you find horse riders they've got to be careful when you find cyclists and walkers and it's it's an awareness thing as well that can be done with all sorts of measures and also just to add to that mike i mean we are very clear that in designing this this, this scheme that roads are accessed for horse riders cyclists walkers public transport users in addition to cars, it isn't just a car only scheme, it's a very much a, a, a way of moving around and people choose that in different ways. And we need to make sure we accommodate all of those, not also take into account some of the ecological impacts as well. Okay, I've got a question then from Jeff, and I think this might be for Mike, Bell or Mark, but they, if, they, if they want to not have it, I'll, I'll, I'll understand. It's very frustrating to have got parking fines for parking outside my house, even though we've been told we all have to work from home. Did you want it's, to... it's technically my portfolio, but, but, but I I, I, we... I'll hand it over to the two, two town board councillors. Well, I don't want to mention yeah. Robert's work. That was all. Yeah, yeah. Thinking. I mean, it, it, it is an enforcement issue. Um, I mean, I, I completely sympathise and, and I've certainly made the point on numerous occasions to um, uh, our parking team that um, I think it is completely unfair. Uh, that uh, when people are being asked to work from home uh, with limited opportunities for parking, particularly in the pay and display zone in Western Supermare, um, it really is unfair for any fines to be issued. When we had uh, lockdowns, so when people had no option, literally no option, uh, but to stay at home, we did take a, a different approach and took a much lighter touch to enforcement. So we only took enforcement action uh, against parking offences uh, where there was an obstruction or a, or a safety reason why uh, that was necessary. But unfortunately, it just hasn't been possible to sustain that approach all the way through the pandemic. Um, but I, I do completely sympathise with you. And, and what I would say is um, I do always appeal if you think that you have been unfairly treated, because uh, even if your appeal isn't necessarily always successful, it does help to influence the debate and the discussion about what our policies are uh, in terms of parking enforcement. And can I stress that please don't take it out on our traffic wardens. They're doing a very difficult job. We're down on numbers because of um, the uh, amount of um, abuse that they do get from the public just doing a job that they're paid to do and they're not paid fantastic amounts of money. But so please don't take it out on our hardworking um, uh, traffic enforcement agents. Or indeed any public servant who's only doing their job. I mean, it's, just, it's pretty tragic when you hear of assaults on emergency workers, ambulance drivers, police officers, uh, firefighters just going to try and save people's lives. And people take it upon themselves to, to attack. So I think, yes, absolutely it's unacceptable to, 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 to um, any way stop them from doing their jobs in a safe way. Right, I've got a question then from uh, Tracy and I'm not the technical, this might be a Mark Canniford question. When will the roads around Western villages be adopted? It's been 20 years now. Police won't enforce dangerous parking as roads not adopted by council. I'm afraid it's a highways issue, so it'll be Councillor Solomon again. Oh, Councillor Solomon, right. <laughs> um, can, I, can I again um, use the same old line? Um, I'll look into that. Uh, because I'm not, I have no data at this moment in time as to when that will happen. I know there's an issue at the moment, well, it has been ongoing in, in somewhere like Porter's Head, where half of the marina at Porter he Porter's Head is, is um, under North Somerset, but the second half, the streets over there, are, are, are persimmons. So it, sometimes there, there are conflicts between the developers and North Somerset that have to be resolved first before we will adopt the roads, but I will look into it. Okay, I mean, to, to, just to be clear as well, I mean, roads have to be to an adoptable standard for us to take them on. Otherwise we are taking on massive liabilities as for council taxpayers that developers should have delivered as part of their scheme. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's an important point to emphasize because what often happens is there's demand to adopt roads 
which the developers haven't provided to a satisfactory standard. And, and it's hard to believe, but even 20 years later, there are definitely roads where they were never built to the standard required. Um, and it's the developer's responsibility. Um, but what I would say is that there are the bulk of roads um, uh, in the new developments in Western Supermare have been adopted, certainly the, one, the older ones in Western Village. So please do um, email details to, to Councillor Solomon so that he can look at the specific circumstances in some of those areas. And even if it isn't adopted highway, we can put pressure on the developer uh, to take action because clearly if there are safety issues and parking problems, problems, um, somebody has to take responsibility for that, whether it's the developer, uh, the, the council or, or the police. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Catherine. Yes, I was just going to uh, um, add my plea. I know as someone who knows Western Village very, very well, there are enormous problems around um, parking. We've had issues where emergency vehicles actually cannot get around the roads because people will park even on a corner. Um, there, there is well, there is parking, but most people's garages are not actually large enough to fit the average car in. So I think, and I hope that the, <clears throat> that the council has learnt some lessons uh, for future developments out of the errors that occurred in, in some of the building that went on in Western Village and particularly when it comes to the roads I think our previous uh, questioner who was talking about dangerous roads in terms of your car that could well be somewhere in Western Village because we have these um, block paving roads and when that there are problems there and the blocks start to sink you get these not exactly potholes but very difficult areas so um, yeah there were a lot of errors I think in terms of what we allowed to happen there. And I'm hoping that our future developments are far, far better well, designed. Well, you, well, I will ask my colleague, Mark Canniford, who leads up planning. He will tell us all about the new uh, parking. Uh, yes. SP, SPDs, I think they are, aren't SPD, they, Mark? SPD, supplementary planning documents, which mm. exactly an executive a fortnight ago. Uh, they are addressing uh, the size of garage space. But I think what I was uh, pleased to see is the garage parking space is no longer considered the parking space for the house. So you, in future building developments, uh, they will have to provide space on the front of the house or on a driveway. Um, of course, there'll always be an issue if you've got a three bedroom house and four cars. There'll always be an issue that you'll never get those four cars in the same space as the house. So. Um, it, it is being addressed by this executive and this council. We are looking at ways to make parking easier, uh, but also added to that, of course, as my colleagues will say, we're trying to make it easier that people who don't want to necessarily own a car can easily ride into Western Supermare to go to work if they want to go to work in town with, you know, with further cycle lanes and further developments that way. So there are lots and lots of things going on, but I can assure you the latest uh, local plan sounds very dull, very boring, but the latest local plan will address a lot of these issues around road standards, house standards, all these things. So we are on it. Thank you. And I, and I hope it will be making our communities much more family friendly as well. I'm going to say by the bell. Uh, OK, and Peter, Peter is asking, he said it's not just potholes. It's the need for many roads to be properly and fully resurfaced. And, he's, yeah, right. and, he's, and he's, he said, e.g. Montpellier, west end of Quantock Road. Do, I would say that yes. our team have, have resurfaced Happerton Lane yeah, in my parish, and they've done a wonderful job yeah, it's, after with, 35 with, years. Yeah, Don, with resurfacing, it's a huge resource, and we, we have to prioritise um, the areas that need resurfacing because there is only a finite amount of money within the budget to do resurfacing and it, it I, I know it's an import, important area where uh, we need to resurface some roads rather than constantly refilling potholes but uh, it's all down to budget and to where we can do those roads and we, we're trying to do as much as we can with the money we have in the budget. I think okay. it's just it's worth noting without wanting to blame the government for everything, although uh, if the cap fits um, the um, you know, we have had um, less money for um, for road maintenance um, over the last few years. 
And when you bear in mind the significant backlog um, in road maintenance that there is across North Somerset, you know, so I, I think a few years ago, the estimate was that it would take us 25 or 30 years at the current rate of progress just to get round everywhere and bring it up to a reasonable standard. And that's before you then get into how do you maintain it at that standard. You can see the scale of the problem. Um, the only thing I would want to say to people is we all use this community as well and we travel around the area and we drive on the roads and we see it too and we absolutely want to try and fix it and if there was money sat there waiting to be spent and if there was an easier way of doing it quicker and better we would absolutely grasp it the the big problem we've got uh, is that the government does not look after um, the, the smaller roads so there is good funding for the big principal routes and for the motorways but on all the other roads the b roads and the a roads that the the deal is very very poor um, if you look at some of the research that the aa and the rac have done they'll tell you that the spending per mile on those roads by government is incredibly low as in, in pence um, and that's and that explains it. That explains why uh, the roads are in, in such a poor condition and, and people really do need to agitate and say, you know, whether the roads or the pavements uh, are good or bad, the government just doesn't take um, getting around and transport seriously. Uh, and it really does need to invest in it if we're going to raise raise the standard. I think we have around um, 10, 10, 12 million pounds to, to spend on the whole of North Somerset roads in a year and you can see how far that would go with the the, the the miles and miles of roads we have everywhere. I mean Mike makes a very valid point Mike Bell in terms of funding doesn't he I mean we were asked a question about doubling the railway line well redoubling it because it used to be doubled into Western Supermare which is a big town I'll come on to Tony's question in a minute um, and we look at the the, the the real waste of money on something like high speed too billions and billions of pounds spent for you know so it's 20 so you can have an extra coffee at Birmingham New Street Station in the 20 minutes you save you know as opposed to actually addressing the real bed and but bread and butter issues around roads and transport more generally which would which would save the whole country but rather than these rather than these um these one or two major schemes Tony is asking a question Don, can I just add, because Montpellier was mentioned, and oh, yes. I can assure I can assure him that we are pushing for Montpellier all the time. Of course, as uh, as Mike has said, and Mike, Mike and Mike um, have, you know, there is huge pressure, but I can assure you that probably any representative or councillor in, in their area is pushing to get these things done. It's, they just can't do them all and they have to make tough decisions. I will still be pushing for Montpellier to be done as it's needed to be done for years. And it's not pothole filling. It needs to resurface because it's falling to bits. However, we'll take keep that, that on board, um, Councillor yeah. Canniford. Thank you, Mike. I know how tough it is to make those decisions. And that was me thinking of a town in the south of France. To Tony, now I'm going to have to, we've got we've got four Western members on this, so I think I think there's going to be some upset when I read out what Tony said. Tony says the suggestion that Western is the second largest town in the southwest is not correct. From figures I've seen, Western is about a quarter of the size of world. So most of the income of Western is derived from world, yet virtually nothing is spent in world except for the odd unemptied dog bin. Now, I did think it was a Western town council that incorporated world, but is there some separatist movement I've uh, not been made aware of? We have a former, we have a former Lord Mayor of, of Western on, on the call. <laughs> so if I go first. <laughs> Uh, Whirl is a part of Western, Whirl is a large area, quite right, and it, used to, it, it is a parish, parish of its own, but it comes in, it comes in the Western parish boundaries. Um, so even, <clears throat> even for example, you go out to St George's, even though the whole lot's connected now, um, St George's isn't in Western Supermare, but Whirl is, uh, and, and with Whirl and Western and, and Ashcombe, um, and, and, and the Coronation and all, Old Mixon used to have its own space when there was space around. So you could argue all these places were separate once, but they're no longer, they're all part of the greater Western Supermare area. Um, and, and I think that happens in most cities and towns. And yes, World does contribute a, a great deal to, to the funds of, of North Somerset, uh, but also World gets a lot of money spent on it in terms of schooling, which I'm sure Catherine can come on and the children who live in World, I'm sure. Lots of people who live maybe in small flats in Western feel they're contributing to those sort of things in Will. Um, so it is a bit of a mix and mash, and, and we do have to understand we all support each other in these sort of funding issues. And we do have a lovely large uh, shopping centre in Will, don't we, which we own ourselves. 
And, and the only thing I would say, and I've said this before on these things, um, I would genuinely encourage uh, anyone watching this to um, give their councillors a hard time. You know, if you don't think that your area is getting the attention that it needs uh, or a fair, fair slice of the catch, cash give, give your councillors a hard time that's what they're there for to stand up for the communities you know we've got responsibilities as executive councillors for the whole of north somerset but we're also ward councillors and it's our job uh, to argue for our for our own areas and, and on that subject um, when you're looking at the uh, the potholes uh, to fix uh, my uh, if you could get the other half of uh, white cross road finished uh, in my ward that would be uh, fantastic but no seriously please do lobby your councillors because you know there are too many councillors dare I say and this is not a political point there are too many councillors who get away with it uh, um, having a pretty easy life um, and they need to be held to account and if they're not doing the job for you and they're not delivering you know what you can do in the local elections next time you can vote them out. I, and from my point of view I will never ever ignore well I went to school in well <laughs> Uh, my wife taught in Will. I love Will. I remember Will when it was just fields. Uh, yeah. And now I know just how many houses there are. So, so from my point of view, I will never ignore you, Will. Believe me. No, none of us. Catherine, do you want, do you want a, in this separatist debate, you, this is a bit like Scotland, isn't it? <laughs> I do the, remember there the was, unionists and the separatists. There was some talk of this on the town council about two years ago. Um, I don't quite know where it came from, but I would say World has a lot going for it. I mean, the, the stuff that Big World does is is amazing. Mm. I, that's a remar it's remarkable. Um, they do some wonderful wildlife walks, and even Chris Sparing has come up and, and done stuff up there because I've taken part. So, so yes. Um, don't leave us, I would say, because we value you up there oh, yes. in the world. Yes, please, um, no home rule for Wales, um, no, Martin, no, no. please. And I'm just fascinated. Oh, sorry. My colleague, Mike Bell, has said councillors will get away with it. Where are these councillors who have an easy time? <laughs> Well, I think you just need to look in the right places, Catherine. Uh, I, I, well, I, presumably I it's getting well, political well, now. Presumably in world by the sound of what Yes, this is getting saying. very political. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop on that. So we'll, separatism for world, we, we, we're going to try and put a, a cap on that. Um, Mark, thank you very much for your comment about streets for people. So I do appreciate that. Um, Sandy is asking, this, 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 there's, a, there's a theme now on, on, on traffic and transport, uh, Mike Solomon. But again, this is a Western question, so I should ask for other contributions. Sandy is saying, are there any plans to get traffic lights at the roundabout from Western Village to the A370, A371? Now that Haywood Village and Locking Partners is residential, the traffic is so fast and it's difficult to safely access the roundabout from Western Villages by the vets. Now, I, have to well, I, I don't know what this is, so I'm going yeah, to have to I, and, and, and it's something I'd have to look into because I've seen no plans. I don't know if my fellow councillors have seen any plans. I've certainly not seen any plans, but we will certainly consider plans where uh, it, it, it becomes dangerous. Yes, obviously, um, uh, we will certainly look into things like that. But I, I've seen no plans unless anybody else has. OK, so I've got a question then. Um, from, did, sorry, did anybody else want to make any comments on that before I move on? Uh, from Dave, Dave, Dave is saying, cycling into town has been mentioned several times, but without secure parking for bikes and trikes. A lot of people are put off doing so. There was talk in previous years of a managed secure bike parking facility in the town. Has there been any progress on this? Mark and Mike, uh, I think uh, you probably answer that one back. So, time. so I think um, so. At the moment, we're exploring potential for um, a bike hub as part of the the Sovereign Centre work, um, and um, I think that's a, a really good suggestion that you've made there, Dave. And we we can we can talk to the officers about the development of the bike hub and and whether we can make sure there's some secure um, managed parking as part of that. I think that's a a good shout because what we're very keen to do is is enable people people to to hire bikes and have access to electric bikes when they're visiting um, the town centre as well so um, I think that's a really good shout um, I think um, Dave will also be interested to know because I know where he lives 
because uh, I used to live there, um, that we are going to be consulting um, starting next week on, on a new scheme for improved um, cycle access into the town centre from Milton Road and Baker Street as well. Um, so we are really keen to try and enable and encourage more people to get into town. Uh, and he's absolutely right that once you get here, you then need somewhere safe and secure that you can park um, park your bike. So um, that's okay. absolutely a good shout. Okay, I've got a question then from Luigi. We need CCTV down Baker Street. What's happening in this area? Is that Mike That's Bell? Me, well, or Mike CCTV Son? is me again, but I'm quite happy to pass this over to Mike Bell. I think it's. I think yeah, it's, I mean, it's in, it's in my ward. We we haven't got CCTV coverage in Baker Street at the moment, and. Um, there's more demand for CCTV cameras than we can possibly meet and fund. But what we have got um, in partnership with Western Town Council and, and the other town councils as well is access to more mobile CCTV cameras now. So if there are particular hotspots or issues in areas, we can deploy mobile cameras um, and hopefully try and, and nip it in the bud. So uh, again, if you, if you want to email me with some of the details about your concerns, I'm very happy to take that up and we can look at uh what what we what else we can do um in baker street okay and the final oh sorry mark i was just going to say and, and just so residents can can feel assured that they're not being ignored there's very strict rules around where cctv cameras can go you can't just say i want a cct cam a cctv camera here there has to be proven activities of crime there has to be uh incidents that um, are reported to the police um, and those are that is legislation which stops uh, a sort of snooping society to develop. So if you do have issues in, in the areas you live, please report them, 101 them, put them into the police, because the, the more incidents that are recorded, the more likelihood is we can get cameras there. OK, I've got um, a couple of final questions um, and then we're past as we are at seven o'clock is um, Alex is asking what's happening with low traffic neighbourhoods? Um, that's, that's covered uh, again with what Mark and Mike were, were saying, I believe, when you're talking about low traffic neighbourhoods. We're doing a, a lot of work towards um, making them more uh, pedestrian and cycle friendly. Uh, I'm assuming that's what he means by that comment, uh, unless you... In an I think so. Uh, there was a specific question around schools. Did you want to say about around schools, Catherine? The fact we've, we've gone for quite a lot of work in terms of keeping traffic away from schools. Yes, indeed, we have. And traffic um, around schools is a major concern, not just for the parents, but I think also for, for the residents who get fed up with... Uh, thoughtless parking in front on their driveways when people are dropping off. So yes, we, we are working closely with schools um, to make sure that parents do park sensibly if they have to drive, but also trying to encourage people as far as possible to embrace you know, active travel and walk or cycle mm. schools wherever possible. The other thing I'd like to say about, um, it's not exactly low traffic areas, but I personally have championed the idea of playing out. Um, in and closing off certain streets at certain times so that they are available for children to play in complete safety. So, and I've spoken to a couple of residents who wanted to do that in their area. So just please keep coming to us with these ideas and schemes and we will do the best we can to implement them if at all possible. Okay, so um, I think we're, we're, we're past our time now. So I'm going to ask a couple of final questions in, in as, as we go around go around the room just for us to set up and um, mark um in terms of your the business uh, environment um jill is asking what is being done to encourage more employment in western and lucy is asking about the cinema complex at dolphin square so i don't know if you if you, your final thoughts you can comment on those at the same time of course in terms of in, encouraging employment there is some encouraging uh, uh, sort of reactions happening in, in North Somerset's direction. Um, I was talking to a, 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 a lead partner in one of the major develop, um, not developers, uh, property sellers in, in the West Country here, in the whole of the Southwest as it happens, and they're saying they're getting uh, multiple inquiries around Western Supermare for businesses to open up. Now, of course, what we have to do is, is make space available for commercial businesses. Um, and, and, that, and that's the tricky bit because bringing uh, uh, utilities into those areas is, is very expensive, but it's something we're working on uh, and it's something we're trying to create. 
but you're right jobs jobs are essential if we have to build houses um and and one has to be there before the other in many ways but uh, and also with the with the sovereign center changes there'll be a lot of workspace in there and a lot of people are working from home now and it's clear places like western are are certainly on the up in terms of working from a place like Western. I mean, you could work from Western, have a walk at lunchtime on the seafront. What a fantastic opportunity. You can't do that from the middle of Bristol. So um, yes, we are trying to find work. It, it's not easy currently. Lots of major companies are contracting, not, not, not opening up sites. So um, we just have to keep pushing for it, but we are in a good place in North Somerset. Okay, Catherine. Yes, just wanted to come in and, and say that we also have worked very hard and adapted our skills strategy um, as a response to the COVID crisis that we've just been through. Mark works with me on that. And we are very committed to making sure that not only do we be an encouraging place for businesses to come to, but that we have a skilled population here and that we're working actively with education providers, whether it's the college or the schools to make sure that we engage with them and businesses to work out the best way to make sure our young people have the best possible future and in fact we'll be starting on that process of engagement the next week when Mark and I and Councillor Holland will be speaking to all the leaders of the multi-academy trusts about our skills and employment strategy see what we can do for them and how we can support them to educate young people to give them the best chance. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, Mike, is there any, Mike Bell, is there any final comments from yourself? I just wanted to actually echo a lot of what's been said about economic recovery. I mean, in the end, um, the responsibility lies on all of us, doesn't it? Because unfortunately, the council on its own isn't going to be able to wave a magic wand and, and transform things. Um, I mean, quite apart from anything else, and I've said this before, you know, we don't set the rents, we don't, uh, we don't set the business rates, we don't own most of the property, so we have really limited levers. You know, we don't run the businesses. Um, we can't um, uh, uh, give them rate, rent rebates or, or, or rate reductions be, because those things are, are set by people outside of our control. Um, what we can do is try and encourage and promote the right conditions for, for businesses to succeed. And we're absolutely trying to do that. I want to give a shout out to the Ascot Group, who are recruiting 200 new staff in, in Whirl at the moment and doing a really good job at shouting about Western and saying, look, this is the place to come and live and work and invest. And I think that's really positive. We've got lots of new um, employment opportunities coming up in, in Clevedon and Nailsey and, and Portishead too. So I think this is a district... Um, and a community that that's going to thrive and do well in the future but it's incumbent on all of us to support our businesses you know instead of complaining about the fact that there aren't the shops that you want or the businesses that you want go out there and support the ones that are there and that's the best thing that we can do to encourage new businesses in mm. because all of the businesses big and small want the same thing they want customers they want business they want support and that's what we need to give them uh, if we want to see a more vibrant high street across our towns but also a stronger economy more generally so it's it's in our gift together uh, to do the right things to support those things to happen um, and and let's just do it Mm. Local, lo lo local, local jobs for local people supporting the local economy, Mike. And that is there's so much to, to to get things better for North Somerset more generally. I'm just absolutely delighted, and in my own parish, that can we got Etex um, has are investing 140 million pounds in, in doubling the size of their factory to produce plasterboard, and the fact they've chosen North Somerset, so, you know, I think it's a massive boost for for us. They could go anywhere in the world pretty much, and they've decided to come to North Somerset. And just just to add, of course, the huge success of food works and mm. focusing North Somerset around the, the, the food and drinks industry yeah. has been a huge success. Many uh, and, and we have to we have to give a lot of that to our previous administration. The fact is they that they were encouraged into that. They took advantage of that. They saw it against a lot of advice, but it has been hugely successful. But what we have to now do is drive that to the next stage. And that is our intention create bigger jobs those jobs are a few jobs really important jobs got some really good products going on but now we need to turn those small uh, businesses into in, into larger medium-sized employers and I'm, I'm not really sure what you meant about Cineworld uh, I imagine that it uh, of course won't be open still currently 
Um, it is one of those groups, Mark, um, if I can butt in here, because I'm an avid uh, cinema goer and follow the trends, etc. It's one of those groups that will be uh, reopening um, their, their cinemas. And there's some real blockbusters coming with the new Bond film in the autumn and various other movies that they'll. And I honestly believe they'll do well. I think people will want to go out to the cinema again. So hopefully our cinema will reopen as one of those. There are other cinemas available, of course, in North Somerset beyond that one. Yes, of course there are. Some very lovely um, cinemas too. Love, there's some very lovely cinemas elsewhere in North Somerset. Clevedon as well, yeah. Clevedon. I was going to say the Curzon is already um, are planning to reopen for business. I know, yeah. I know that the the Odeon um, is looking to do so, and I think you're right, Mike. Um, Cineworld has confirmed that they're going to reopen um, from from the 17th, so that's really promising. The bigger picture at Dolphin Square in Western is there's a lot of work to be done because there By are the far, bigger far picture. Too... Do you mean cinema? When yeah, you the far, the thank you. The far, there are far, with... far too many empty units there. Mm. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's owned by a private um, pension fund. So again, you know, we've got really limited opportunities to um, to to get things moving there. But I just want to assure people that we're doing everything we can to talk to the managing agents, to talk to the 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 pension fund that owns. Uh, the Dolphin Square site to encourage them to do the right things. And I know that there is interest from um, new operators um, in the pipeline, which will hopefully move forward now the unlocking is happening. So again, I think there is reason to be optimistic, but just to assure you, we don't sit in the town hall and complete, well, in fact, we don't sit in the town hall actually at the moment, but, um, but, but we don't ignore these things. We're not blind to them. Um, we're absolutely fighting the corner all the time as best we can. Okay, and we're committed to using those local facilities whenever we possibly can as councillors. And we, you know, if, 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 if everybody joins us in that, then that makes a much more vibrant town and indeed North Somerset. So thank you. Uh, but for your final say, Mike, I've got a question about Camp Road, um, about why it's been resurfaced. But I don't know whether I'm going to get Peter to email you separately on that, because I think that's a bit of a yeah. pause. Mark Canniford. Did you do it? No, again, it's in it's in our ward. But I just wanted to. I've, I've actually I Facebooked a, a picture a few weeks ago, that, uh, and just just because I'm, I'm I'm Michael, just fill in on this in a moment. But we do have a vehicle which goes around and it measures all sorts of different things on a road, it, the, the the skid resistance, the depth of the tarmac. So things you might not see as a problem could very clearly be there. Is that right, Mike? Uh, and um, and so they might be serviced a road which you might not think is re yes. servicing, yeah, but it, it's, it's basically a skid pan and it needs there, to be. Yeah, done. there's all sorts of factors that um, technically go yeah. into, you know, the build up of the road and what's going underneath it that we don't see, but the experts uh, can. So, yes, you're right. Thank you. Anything else? Any other final comments, Mike Solomon? You've had quite a lot to do already. So, you might... yeah, no, thank you. I'm just looking forward to my supper. Good. Well, I'm trying to get very close to the end so you can go and have it. I don't want you, I don't want you collapsing. Well, so thank uh, you, th th thank you, thank you for, for, for tuning in and listening to us and posing those questions. I hope we did our best to answer them in a, in, in, in a, in a way in which you felt we, uh, we gave you the information you required. It's great to do these. We'll do these, another one of these again next month. Look forward to seeing you then. Um, and to echo Mike Bell's comments at the beginning, thank you to everybody in North Somerset who's worked so hard to follow the rules, to get the infection rates down, to take the vaccines. Um, we as a council couldn't do this by ourselves. You know, we are 500 among 220,000. It's the people of North Somerset who produce this result. So my thanks is to you and, and, and the health and emergency workers and public servants who've been out there, all the volunteers. You know, you know who you are yeah, yeah. and we thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Good yeah. evening. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs>